Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Launchpad. I'm Christian Reddy, your friendly neighborhood astronomer. First of all, I wonder if anybody can see this or or hear me. Um, so if you are, just give me a shout, let me know, and uh, welcome to Friday. Hopefully this is working, but we'll see. Okay. Um, let's see, I see Circusy, I see Antonio, I see Peter Quinn. Uh... Greetings, everyone. Okay, I see Peter Quinn saying hi, Launchpad Astronomy. So, you guys all seeing me? I hope you are. And uh, welcome to Friday. Fantastic, loud and clear. I love it when things actually work. It's so nice to be here and so nice to be with you. You know, gosh, I, I've missed you all. I, it's been a while since we live streamed. And uh, there's been so many things going on in the universe. And uh, there's also, uh, if any of my students are present, uh, there's also an exam next week, or as I like to call them, a celebration of knowledge, which means that we will be celebrating your knowledge. But we're here to celebrate all of our knowledge and, and just see, what, uh, see what's going on. So thank you all for coming by, and uh, thank you all for joining me today. Now, I've got a few bits of gear here that I've been spending money on so i hope it's all working obviously i've got a new microphone boom arm and all that kind of stuff so you won't hopefully get too much uh interference uh from the background noises uh while i try to uh well i while i basically try to sound intelligent i <laughs> uh, just want to welcome a few folks here i see uh heba mandor mike perez uh, El Jefe Reviews. Oh, El Jefe. Hey, there he is, the big man himself. We got Shane DeVille. Good to see you guys. This is fantastic. So many familiar faces and so many new ones, too, which is really exciting. Um, so what I thought would uh, what I thought we could do again if you are one of my students and you have a question please know that your questions do get top priority otherwise we'll just pick a topic and talk about it um, obviously it's been a long time since I've had a chance to uh, to talk a little bit about um, well to do much of anything on YouTube it's been a well it's been a crazy month and it's just been one of those months but there has been uh, obviously some incredible news that's come up that I'll be doing some videos about, but obviously not the least of which is the fact that we now have an image of a black hole. And maybe you are, maybe you have seen uh, all the images, maybe you have watched all the videos, uh, maybe you have read all the read all the newspaper articles. But I don't know about you guys, but I have been obsessed with trying to understand exactly what it is we are seeing. I mean, this is the black hole at the center of M87. First of all, you know, let, let, let's just take a look at this thing. I mean, it, you know, it, it it sure does look uh, like a black hole to me. In fact, I'll just go ahead and bring this up. And uh, hey, I see that you're from Egypt. Wow, fantastic. It's so good to see you. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, this is just a truly remarkable accomplishment. So what I'm going to try to do here is just bring up a little slideshow that I'm working on <clears throat> that'll form the basis of my uh, of my upcoming video. But uh, I'll share it with you here. Uh, we'll get this going. And I think if I switch over to this screen, I believe you can now see that beautiful image of the black hole at M87. Now, please let me know if you're not seeing it. Uh, Brad Karmbach, hey, one of my students, fantastic, good to see you. Shane DeVille, how you doing? Uh, and uh, Frank Frank Jump, good to see you. I was married to one. Okay, well, mm, never mind. Uh, anyway, there it is in all of its glory. Let me know if you're not seeing the picture of the black hole, uh, or let me know if you are seeing the, the picture of the black hole. I just wanted to uh, just, just talk about this. Uh, because what we are seeing here, it took me quite some time to figure this out, but we are actually not seeing the black hole. I mean, I know it sounds completely counterintuitive. What are you talking about? Didn't you say that we were supposed to be seeing a picture of a black hole? And I'm not showing you a picture of a black hole. It's because we can't really see a black hole. Obviously, it is, in fact, you know, an object that is unseeable by its own definition, right? We cannot see, so you're not seeing the picture, you're just seeing me. Just a 
so you're not seeing okay so you're not seeing the picture all right no problem let's see if we can get that to work how about now do you see the picture now okay not seeing it hang on let's see. give it a second here uh no image on screen unless you are the image of m87 uh i am not the image okay so we are seeing matter falling into it okay so level with me guys you're seeing you're saying there is no picture huh that's kind of strange because according to my screen here you're supposed to be seeing the black hole image i'm not sure what's going on i'm going to have to make some adjustments on the fly uh oh you are seeing it okay okay I think what's happened is that uh, we're on a lag, probably 10 or 20 seconds. Uh, so I had put this up, and now you're just seeing it. And now you're just hearing me tell you that you just saw it, even though you saw it seconds ago. <laughs> Gotta love. Gotta love this whole thing. Well, anyway, so is it the destroyed objects that we see around the black hole? You know, actually, I'll tell you what's going on, or at least to the best of my understanding. I mean, to, to kind of work it all the way back, uh, to kind of work it all the way back, uh, from first principles, I got some script here. Uh, you know, we are talking about, yeah, you're seeing behind the scenes of one of my presentations that I spend way more time on than I really should. But okay, let's fix all this. Let me, let me just get into this and sorry, guys, gonna get ah. Uh, you know, this is what I get for not uh, for not preparing, which is odd because I spent like the entire day just getting everything set up and it was really crazy. But what I want to do is I want to try to show you uh, this little schematic here that I've put together. Okay, so hopefully you're seeing it. Now you've got this picture of a, uh, well, a black hole, right? And you've got, uh, you've got a disk of material uh, swirling around it. So let's start off with the beginning here. We've got uh, we've got a black hole that is unseeable. Okay, and a black hole is always going to be described by this critical radius, right? We're seeing, uh, you know, there's there's a, a limit. Like the black hole itself is crushed to an infinitely tiny volume of space. We're talking about a singularity. Then there's a critical radius called the Schwarzschild radius, right? And the thing about the Schwarzschild radius is that it's you know, only the the radius of the black hole uh, multiplied by, uh, or sorry, rather, it's only the mass of the black hole multiplied by uh, some constants of nature, you know, such as, you know, the gravitational constant and divide that by the speed of light squared and multiply the whole thing by two. And bam, you've calculated the Schwarzschild radius. It's a relatively easy calculation to make. It wasn't an easy thing to come up with, but now that Thanks to Carl Schwarzschild, we now have an easy way of calculating this thing. So the the Schwarzschild radius becomes the event horizon. Okay, so let's just bring that up just to kind of mark that. So we have the event horizon. Okay, let me go back one here. Oh, I've actually gone too far ahead. Hey, thank you so much, El Jefe, for the super chat. I appreciate you, buddy. Thank you so much, man. Oh, every little bit helps, and uh, that's so kind of you. So we have... We have this, so we have our uh, uh, we have our event horizon. Okay, now the disk itself, you know, matter swirling around in the disk, and there's basically a limit to how far away matter can approach the black hole. Okay, this is called the innermost stable circular orbit, or ISCO, and that's at about three short short child radii. So, what does this all mean? Well, this means that light you know, obviously cannot escape if it's inside the event horizon. Uh, but if light is close to the event horizon, okay, something really interesting happens. And that something uh, works kind of like this. Let me, let, me go, let me take it back a little bit here. We have our Schwarzschild radius. We have our event horizon. Okay, light is able to radiate away from the event horizon, but only if, sorry for the bump there, only if it's going directly away. Okay, that's a key thing because what happens next is that if there's a beam of light that is, you know, just traveling like sideways with respect to the event horizon or with respect 
you know, to the event horizon. If it's close enough, it gets drawn into the black hole, right? So it's gone. You're not going to see it. If it's radiating directly away, you're good to go. So that means that there's like a critical distance uh, called the photon sphere. So from this point, you know, light is basically trapped into orbit around the black hole, okay? And this orbit is very unstable, right? So, so that means some of that light uh, falls into the black hole. The rest of that light is deflected away. Okay, so now we've got this situation where you've got light that is basically being scattered around this black hole. Okay, uh, so that's the photon sphere. Notice that the photon sphere is not the Schwarzschild radius, but it's actually one and a half Schwarzschild radius away, right? And yeah, Frank uh, says this creates a torus of light. Exactly, that's exactly what this does. Uh, let me try to bring it up here. Uh, this ultimately creates, uh, let me see here. Uh, do I have a picture of it here? Hmm. Now, like I said, I didn't really prepare this presentation, so I'm just playing around here. But yeah, what you get is you'll see something, and I'll bring up this animation in a moment uh, so we could all take a quick look at it here, make sure we're all on the same page. But... What you end up with is, let me find this guy. Nope, that's not it. That's not it. That's not it either. That's not it. That's not it. That's not it. But I bet this is it. Okay, so let me bring this up over here. All right, you guys all seeing this little animation coming up? So now what we're doing is we're taking a look into the black hole. We're actually passing through M87. We're now seeing the accretion disk, and there's that bipolar jet outflow uh, that is radiating uh, at speeds, really mu very much approaching the speed of light. So let's, get, let's work our way down into the black hole for a second. Now we are just surrounding the photon sphere. So you see the event horizon in blue. Uh, at the very center, then you got the photon sphere. So light is flinging around the photon spheres. This is that incredible gravitational lensing. Okay, so from any given direction, all right, it builds up this uh, this ring of light, this photon ring. So if you look in the simulation, you see the photon ring is really well defined. Okay, but then you've got stuff that is. Uh, still falling in, right? There's a little bit of matter, a little bit of emission coming from in front of the black hole. There's a jet coming, uh, you know, emerging from this thing. So we're seeing some of the emission from the jet. We're also seeing emission from the jet facing away from the black hole. That's what's really uh, interesting about this. So this is what builds up this really messed up swirling image. To say this again, we are not seeing an accretion disk. Okay, we are seeing light, synchrotron, radiation coming from the black hole's jet. That's what's really, really cool. So uh, the fact of the matter is that we've only got a little bit of, uh, we've only got, uh, you know, a, a, a kind of a, quote, crummy resolution. Our telescope is only the size of Earth. So things blur out a little bit, right? So we're seeing that effect as well. That's, uh, that's the other thing. So I hope that was a little bit, semi-explanatory, what we are talking about is a photon ring. We're not talking about a photon sphere. We're not talking about, uh, we're not talking about the accretion disk. No, what we are really seeing is the photon ring caused by the lensing of light around the black hole. Now, um, that only took me uh, the better part of a month to completely convince myself that that's what I was seeing because I was reading all the papers and still getting confused. But uh, anyway, that's what my next video is going to be about. I think just clarifying all this. Um, let me go put myself back to uh, HD. Okay. Um, so uh, I've got... Uh, let, me, uh, let me go back here. Let me just scroll back up, make sure I'm catching everybody. Um, and I've got, uh, oh, thank you so much, Lesic. $5 Canadian. Thank you so much. Oh, man. Dude, cheers, Calgary. Canada. Oh, Canada, our home and native land. Thank you so much. <laughs> 
Uh, so, Circusy saying that the equation should be um, shouldn't be two gm over r uh, two gm over c squared. No, I, okay, yeah. There's a lot of confusion there. Uh, no, the, the short solid radius is twice that. Okay, and uh, that's why I'm trying to be really careful to point out. I'm talking about the short solid radius. Not there's another type of radius called the gravitational radius that the EHT team defined. I don't want to get into what that is right now, but that's uh yeah. That's just another reality. So, what do you think, guys? That's that's what our image is. Um, obviously, the fact that it's all blurry is just because, you know, like I said, the telescope's only the size of Earth. I mean, what are you going to do? Well, I'll tell you what. I, I, I found out what they plan to do. What they plan to do is add more radio telescopes to the Event Horizon Telescope. And that will, that will not necessarily increase the resolution of the image, but that will increase so that'll improve the fidelity of the image or the sensitivity of the image. Um, basically, your uh, your image fidelity, you know, how true the image is, because this is, after all, a reconstruction that took two years to do, by the way, but how true the image is to reality uh, depends on how many telescopes you can get in there. And it turns out the power of your telescope goes as like the number of telescopes squared. So even adding just one more receiver to the EHT telescope will really improve the quality of the image. Um, the nice, uh, the nice thing about this is that they're doing just that. They're adding in telescopes from Kitt Peak. Um, there's a couple telescopes that had to leave, but they're bringing at least one more telescope on. I think they're going to bring probably two or three new ones on as well. Uh, then it turns out that they did, you know, everything that we're looking at right now is based on uh, the data that was taken in 2017. Well, they did another observing run in 2018. This one involved the Greenland telescope. So again, more telescopes equals, you know, better, better quality. Um, yeah, so we are talking about different radius, uh, just to be really clear. Let me do something here. You know, I'm kind of picky about my shots. I want to make sure that I don't look like I've got stuff growing out of my head. I'm just going to drop that over there. There we are. Now, good. Now I've got a little bit of space for my big fat head in between in between all my uh, all my little bits uh, on my shelf. <laughs> okay, um, so what do I think gravitational lensing? Oh, this is this is an interesting question, everybody. Um, Digital Lair says, do I think gravitational lensing can someday be used for communication? Um, you know, I guess in principle, maybe it could, right? Because if you could, uh, if you could somehow. Uh, I don't know, send out some kind of a message or encode some pulsating messages and uh, lens that through uh, lens that around a black hole. Yeah, I think that's a that's an interesting idea that might just work. Who knows? Uh, good question, Digital Air. Hey, Eddie Smallhorn, how you doing? Good to see you. And uh, yes, I'm OCD. Yeah, you know me. Hey, Crypto Cruising, thank you so much. Good to see you here, brother. And uh, by the way, I just want to say thank you so much to uh, Neil from Crypto Cruising. Uh, Neil was helping me remotely to get everything set up and tuned in. Um, uh, you know, like I said, I got some new equipment here, and this just uh, required some setup. In fact, it took me more time to actually get things working that I didn't have time to do a whole lot of research for today's, uh, today's live stream. But that's okay. We'll play it by ear. Like I said, I'm just here to hang out with you guys and... Uh, and chat with you for a little bit. Well, let's see. Um, so there is uh, a oh, man, Neil, dude, man, I should be paying you, brother. Thank you so much for the super chat. Uh, creator supporting show, love from Liverpool, England. Love you too, man. Thank you so much. That's so cool. <laughs> I really appreciate that. Uh, let's see. So, Digital Layer, you're writing a script about it. Oh, cool. So, Digital Layer says, you're writing a script about it. Okay, so tell me what your script is. Are you a screenwriter? Got to know more about what's going on there. So, that's so cool. Uh, anyway, so guys, what else you want to talk about? There's much going on. Have you seen this new image from the Hubble Space Telescope? Actually, let me get back here. It's not a new image. It's a collage of images. It's the deepest mosaic ever made. Um, to kind of start the story, you may have heard about the Hubble Deep Field. That was the first ever deep field image uh, ever made 
and uh, it was just an amazing uh, achievement back in 1995. Okay, keep in mind, we're talking more than 20 years ago, and that was with uh, Hubble's uh, second generation camera. Since then, it's, uh, it's, it's gotten quite better, right? Uh, updated cameras have been added, and get a load of this. Uh, let, me, let me do this. Let me run this video here, and I think you'll uh, be able to appreciate what's happening. So I'm going to bring this up over here, <clears throat> and I'm going to, uh, oh, let me do something here, let me close that, bring this up, and uh, just, oh, Christina Smallhorn, thank you so much for the super chat, oh man, guys, I love you guys, you're so cool, thank you so much, I appreciate it, Christina, you're the best, but I want to bring this up, I'll, I got to show you this, because it's it's way cool. Hey, James Dugan. How you doing? Good to see you, man. Uh, let's go ahead and just run this. And, uh, yeah, so we're zooming in on the Hubble Legacy field. Okay, I'm going to turn off my little overlay here. There you go. And uh, we're just zooming in on this thing. And what we're looking at, uh, that was a little bit too short, but... Um, what we are looking at is, like I said, it's a series of ultra deep images made by the Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, and there we go. It's right here. Take a look at this right here. I'll do this instead. We'll make it work. We'll make it work. And we'll just give this a bit to, wow, this is, this is so big. This has taken so long to download. Yeah, okay. <laughs> there we go. So this is called the Hubble Legacy Deep Field. And uh, what they've done is... Uh, yeah, I think we're still waiting for this thing to download. But what they've done is they took all of... Uh, they took all of uh, Hubble's deepest images and they took as many as they possibly could. And these are just not images that were just made once and done. Uh, these are images... Uh, that were taken over the lifetime of Hubble's service. It's been, you know, in orbit now for somewhere on the order of about uh, 29 years. Okay, actually, it was just 29 years this month, as a matter of fact. Gosh. And now what we're seeing, um, you know, are just all these galaxies. I mean, honestly, what you're seeing in this image, there are very, very few stars. This is one star. Okay, this is a star in our galaxy. Take a look at everything else. It's nothing but galaxies. Each galaxy with somewhere around 100 billion stars. I mean, just think about that for a second. That's just, that's just incredible. It's mind-blowing. And to have this sort of panorama of the cosmos uh, with this clarity, um, like I said, there are, there are far more stars. Sorry, there are far more galaxies than stars. So I think this is going to end up as a... Uh, as an upcoming video, what do you guys think? Uh, I just think this is just so incredible. And uh, if I was obsessed with that image of the black hole for a month, I will probably be lost in this image for the next month, which means that's pretty much the end of my YouTube career. I'm just going to be too damn busy creating stuff. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I agree with you, uh, Rike. It is, it is surreal uh, to see these things. Um, one thing I can tell you is that parts of these images, some parts of these images uh, show more galaxies than others. And the reason for that is because, uh, you know, Hubble was used to make uh, some extremely deep images, uh, very, very long time exposure images of, you know, one part of the sky. That's the Hubble ultra deep or rather extreme deep field. Okay, so they actually did three deep field images. No, four, sorry. Anyway, whatever. The, the latest, greatest extreme deep field is more or less in the center of this image. Uh, but then Hubble took other deep fields, maybe not quite as deep. And so it's for this reason that we're seeing, uh, you know, some areas that have, you know, are a bit more densely populated with galaxies, like in here, uh, is pretty much, I think this is the uh, extreme deep field. And then you have other areas that aren't quite so populated with galaxies, you know, but hey, it's not so bad, right? I mean, it's just, it's just an incredible uh, amount of, uh, of information encoded in this image that I just thought was just just wonderful to uh, to share with you. Just, uh, I don't know, I, I can, what can I say? I really do like this stuff. 
<laughs> uh, let me go back to my original scene. Let me just uh, catch a couple of folks. Uh, Karav Reddy, wow. Hey, I like your name. That's great, Karav. Um, and uh, better and better. Hi, everyone. Welcome aboard. It's so nice to have you here. Harley Pebbly. Harley Pebbly, good to see you, my friend. How are you? And of course, Peter Quinn. Can't, can't have a live stream without Peter Quinn. And James Dugan, it's nice to see you, sir. Welcome. Good to have so good to have you back. Uh, anyway, what else we got going on? What else is happening? There's so many other things going on. First of all, you know, bringing the story way, way closer to home. Have you had a chance to hear their earthquake on Mars? I guess it's a Mars quake, right? Well, actually, I got to really, really step back here. Um, we're not talking about uh, necessarily a quake. We're talking about some sort of seismic event. And uh, the way to the way to look at this is. Uh, the Mars InSight lander, you know, was designed to probe the interior of Mars. And if you're one of my students, you know that we were talking about the interior of Mars. And by the way, the interior of Mars is something that will be on next week's exam. So I know that you're totally, totally down with, uh, with the interior of Mars, right? But anyway, um, they placed some seismic experiments, of, well, really just one seismometer, place it on the ground in front of the InSight lander. And this, by the way, was the first time, is the first time that a seismometer has ever been deployed onto the surface of Mars. And that's a critical, a critical uh, accomplishment. I mean, it sounds trivial. We'll just put the damn thing on the ground. What's the problem? Yeah, you're putting the thing on the ground from, you know, about 20 million kilometers or what have you, or sorry, about, you know, 120 million kilometers away, right? However far apart Earth and Mars are right now. So it was by no means uh, a trivial, a trivial task. So what did they do? Well, they got, uh, you know, they've been listening for some kind of seismic activity because the key thing is that the way we understand the interiors of, well, of our planet is through seismic events, right? Namely, you know, uh, earthquakes and volcanoes. So now what they've done is, you know, they're trying to do the same thing on Mars. They're trying to listen for seismic events, which aren't necessarily going to be earthquakes or volcanoes or, or Mars quakes and volcanoes, but they could be anything else, right? I mean, Mars has probably lost a lot of its internal heat, maybe all of its internal heat. We don't know. And maybe, uh, you know, it's starting to cool and settle down a little bit. So it had this very, very faint rumble. This is the first seismic signal detected by the seismometer on Mars. Let me adjust my microphone here. Apologies for all that noise. And it's now actually caught its first rumble. Now, the problem is they don't yet know what has caused this, right? This, this could be, um, like I said, it could be Mars settling a little bit. There's an outside chance that it might have been a meteor strike, a meteorite strike. Although I think that that is unlikely just because we have spacecraft flying overhead and they're taking pictures to see if there are any new craters. And so if they discover new craters, then perhaps, yes, that will be the cause of this particular uh, particular uh, seismic event on Mars. Anyway, I think that was just some really cool news and, uh, and, and uh, you know, how neat is that? Darren Green brings it in with... Uh, uh, never mind, Darren. Yeah, okay. Thank you, Darren. Yeah, the first margin fart ever recorded. That's awesome, Darren. That's 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 fantastic. <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, but uh, yeah, James is asking. James is asking meteor strikes. Yeah, uh, James. Uh, obviously, you know we may not be seeing meteors streaking across the Martian sky, although that is entirely possible. But you know, Mars is undoubtedly. Uh, getting impacted uh by you know small m meteoroids right that are coming in from uh coming in from above so yeah it's entirely possible that if these are large enough they may in fact be able to create uh to create some uh some seismic events one thing though to be really clear about this is that this seismometer is extremely sensitive. I mean, it's really as good as any seismometer that we have here on Earth, and it's capable of detecting displacements as tiny as the diameter of a hydrogen atom. I mean, that's just how sensitive 
this seismometer really is. So if it's capable of detecting that, um, it can detect not just major events such as shifting underneath the surface or uh, a meteor impact or something like that, but it can actually uh, it can actually uh, detect you know even like the wind blowing over the surface. I mean, that, that's how sensitive it is. And there's a lot less wind on Mars when you think about it. We're talking about an atmosphere that is something like 0.007, the pressure, atmospheric pressure that we have here on Earth, right? We're talking about an extremely tiny uh, amount of atmosphere, or, or at least a, a relatively small amount of atmosphere. So you're not going to get a lot of wind, and yet it's able to pick that up. It can hear the hum of the wind. It's that sensitive. So you know, I think this is a really good first result. Obviously, they got to work out what this is, but uh, this can this bodes well. I think we're going to start to uh, understand the interior of Mars better, and uh, hopefully, understand whether or not there is some whether or not there's still heat in there, and if so, how much uh, is Mars really geologically dead, or is it geologically mostly dead? Uh, to quote the Princess Bride, uh, who knows? So, all right. So, what else we got here? Uh, a meteor is a different rumble to a quake. Yeah, exactly, uh, Peter. They're going to have their own unique... Uh, so yeah, Peter points out uh, a meteor is a different rumble to a quake. Yeah, that's my understanding as well, right? I mean, every seismic event has its own unique signature, and they haven't yet concluded what, what event this was. So hopefully they'll be able to do this. But but the reason why I'm particularly interested in those meteor impacts is because they can ring. they'll ring the planet. And that can help figure out, okay, are we dealing with a solid-only interior, or is there a liquid layer surrounding the core like we have here on Earth? Hey, Charlie, how you doing, my friend? Good to see you. Uh, and uh, let's see. Uh, Peter Bond asks, could it, could it detect life? Um, the short answer is, I mean, the... the, 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 the yeah, I mean, if I'm being, if we're being completely honest, it could detect life if there was like something walking around out there, right? You know, but it would have to be just sort of like one thing, uh, walking around out there. Um, it's it like it's sensitive enough. I think it probably could, but it's not really the sort of thing that you want to use to detect life. If you want to detect life, what you really want to do is bring a chemistry set with you, and you want to scoop up some sample of the Martian soil. Uh, put it into uh, an oven, you might say. <coughs> Excuse me. Heat it up and feed it, uh, feed it some organic compounds, right? Basically, food, and then see if if that life uh, emits, you know, methane and other byproducts from the consumption and digestion of those carbons uh, or of those organic compounds. Uh, this is uh, pretty much what the Viking landers did back in the 1970s. You know, scooped up some soil, put it in a vault, baked it, fed it, and nothing really happened, right? And that was sort of it. Like, there were three tests that it did. Uh, two just had no return at all. One was inconclusive. Um, so we don't really think, you know, we don't know if life's on Mars. If, if it is, it's probably got to be deep underground, maybe just hanging out in there. It's not really clear. Uh, so yeah, I wouldn't use a seismometer to detect, to detect life. Um, I would I would do some more chemistry experiments. Uh, let's see. Um, and uh, uh, case, yeah, Viking seismometer had problems with wind noise, right? Yes, it did. Uh, Vikings. So Viking was, you know, that was our first time ever landing on the red planet, and. That was, you know, like a, a free for all. Like everybody wanted a piece of Viking, you know. And my, what I mean by that is every science team wanted to have an experiment on Viking. Uh, Viking's primary mission was, you know, to search for life, right? Well, actually, its primary mission was to be the first to land on Mars, take pictures, data, learn everything you can look about it, everything, learn everything you can learn about it, and then go fishing for life, or at least just do some basic experiments just to see if anything obvious is there. Uh, but the size, the geologists did manage to sneak uh, seismometers on Viking 1 and 2. So there were two seismometers that landed on Mars. The problem, though, is that those, those spacecraft were not designed 
to deploy those seismometers, to place them onto the surface. And so you're absolutely right. Uh, Viking 1 seismometer did not uh, set itself up, okay? Um, you know, it, it failed, basically. And there's a story behind that, but I won't get into it. The second seismometer on Viking 2, it did activate, okay? It did set itself up. That's the good news. But the bad news is, is that it was literally on on the deck of the Viking lander. So it was picking up all kinds of seismic activity from the lander itself, right? Every time the machines were running, every, th every time, you know, it, it ran experiment, it would just vibrate and it would just pick all that up. So you're right, uh, okay, it, Viking's seismometer experiment was just a complete bust and uh, they, had no, uh, they had no useful data. So this is the first time we've ever gotten really, you know, this is the very first time that we've gotten no kidding, seismic data on Mars. Okay, hey, I see one of my students. Hey, Flavio, how you doing? Um, can, okay, so, hey, Professor Reddy, can you tell us what is going to be on the exam on Thursday? The answers, preferably. Yeah, sure, Flavio, let me look that up here. <clears throat> um, the answers are going to be uh, A, uh, B, uh, C uh, and oh, I got I got D in there as well. So good luck, Flavio. All right, nicely done. Uh, let's see. Um, I probably didn't answer completely all the questions. Okay, what? Uh, so Flavio, did you have a follow up question to that? <laughs> did you have a follow up question? <laughs> uh, let's see. Um, Okay, so, ah, boy, I like this question from Ser Serenity. Uh, so what is my opinion on plate tectonics on super-Earths or mega-Earths? You know, um, yeah, that's funny you should ask that because uh, I don't really know uh, if, if uh, mega-Earths or, you know, er planets that are larger than Earth can have plate tectonics. I mean, we just know so little about them. I, I think, if I remember correctly, I think some early work, there's only like one paper uh, that does anything on super-Earths. I think it was back from like 2003. It's a pretty old paper. And uh, I think what they, what they concluded was that it probably could not have plate tectonics. But, you know, that's a very... There was enough... There was enough uh, there's so little that we know about it. I, I think the jury is still very much out. Uh, so I think that, you know, I, I, let me put it this way. I would hope that there could be some plate tectonics, right? Because, you know, Earth's plate tectonics have done wonders for our geology. I mean, it's given us this geologically diverse landscape and may have played a role in the ability for life to take root. Uh, I'm not saying that, you know, these plate tectonics are, um, you know, short period, we know that these things can take, you know, it could take hundreds of millions of years for the surface to change itself significantly. But what we may be seeing, uh, if we can get plate tectonics on mega on super earths, then I think that can help to improve its habitability because you get a variety of geological situations. You get tide pools, and if it has a moon and you've got water coming in, water coming out, that can add as that can serve as an energy gradient. That's just another energy gradient. That life can take advantage of. So unfortunately, uh, beyond uh, beyond, I don't know. Uh, my answer is I don't know, but I sure hope so. <laughs> it's a that would be my thing because that just gives that, that just gives life a you know a larger canvas to uh, a larger canvas to uh, to paint itself upon. Uh, let's see. Um, Okay, so Gregoris, uh, Gregoris says, can it be simpler things like maybe lava tube collapsing or a landslide? Oh, you mean on Mars? Yeah, absolutely, it could be. They, they haven't yet worked out exactly, uh, you know, what it is, uh, which is a shame because I wanted to do a video and say, hey, here's what they think it is. All I'm going to be able to say unless something happens between now and then is, is that, yeah, you know, there's a seismic event, the seismometer's working, rock on, let's make this, you know, let's do this. Okay. Have I missed any questions from any of my students? Um, I just want to make sure I'm co covering everybody. Da, 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 da. Um, da, 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 da. 
don't think so. I don't think I've got any more students. Hey, students, if I've if I've not answered your question, hit it up in the chat. We'll uh, we'll we'll keep we'll we'll circle back on that. All right. Uh, let me think here. I'm getting this annoying notification. I apologize, everybody. Every time I'm using the software called Ecam, and what it's doing is it keeps throwing notifications, and it's so irritating. Uh, I have no idea what's going on with it. Okay. Uh, let's see. Uh, we could use those lawn, uh, those lava tubes, those lawn. Oh, uh, yeah. Okay. Right. Uh, we could use those lava tubes. Yeah. Um, you're right, Peter, because, uh, you know, Mars has got this really hostile environment on the surface, right? It's, uh, it's, it's farther from the sun, sure. And it's getting less solar radiation, uh, than the earth gets. Fair enough. The problem, though, is that Mars lacks, well, it lacks a couple of things. It lacks a magnetic field. And because of that lack of a magnetic field, Mars is getting pummeled by solar wind particles, right? So that's that's not good because they tend to be, you know, they tend to be a little radioactive, right? They, they tend to be, they tend to be kind of like not good for you. Uh, another problem is that Mars's atmosphere is so thin, it lacks ozone, Ozone is what protects ultraviolet radiation from reaching the surface. So if you're walking around on Mars, in addition to just not having any air to really breathe, uh, you are also getting irradiated. Uh, that's why, <clears throat> uh, so Peter, that's why to your point, uh, lava tubes, uh, if we were to colonize Mars, a great place to start is not on the surface, but underneath it. So if we can find you know, lava tubes that are not collapsed, I mean, that are open, you know, caves, anything like that, anything where we can use as much of the Martian surface as possible to protect us, that's a great place to go setting up shop. That's a great place uh, to start to start your livings on Mars. Now, I realize nobody wants to live underground for the rest of their lives. Um, sure, I understand that. But at the very least, that's a good starting place that you know is going to be safe. Then you can build up you know, radiation hardened structures above the surface. And, uh, well, after that, you'd probably would have to figure out some way of terraforming Mars to, uh, to naturally protect you from, from those sorts of harmful, uh, radiation. So, uh, okay. <coughs> All right. So Flavio back with the question. Okay. Okay. Fine. You mentioned how any terrestrial planet has the ability to have rings. However, why would the sun not affect that? Wouldn't the water ice melt? Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, Flavio's right. You you are going to... Uh, so we talked... So for those of you who aren't in my class, we were talking about rings around planets uh, just, uh, just yesterday, weren't we? And um, it turns out that uh, there's no rule that, you know, all of the giant planets have rings. And uh, there are even some asteroids that have rings. Um, there's no rule that says that terrestrial planets, you know, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars could not have a ring. But Flavio is making an astute observation. This is why he is one of my best and brightest, uh, because he says, you know, you are going to get more radiation from the sun. And that's true. You're closer to the sun, so you're going to be withstanding uh, greater amounts of radiation. Uh, so if you've got particularly water ice in your rings, you know, you're really susceptible to photo dissociation. If your rings are made of volatiles, they're going to break apart. Now, if your rings are made of hardier stuff, okay, if your rings are made of maybe organics or silicates or something like that, then I think you've got greater staying power, okay? Otherwise, if it's made of lighter stuff, uh, molecular compounds of you know, that are essentially volatiles, again, water, you know, hydrocarbons and so forth. Yeah. Then you're going to be uh, receiving way too much ultraviolet radiation that will break apart or, you know, melt the rings away over time. Uh, so what can you do to combat that? How can you dress your Mars or your Venus or Earth with a ring system and give it some staying power? Well, what you have to have uh you know, again, in addition to the composition of the rings, you also need shepherd moons, right? And those shepherd moons are what are responsible for keeping those ring particles 
kept together. The closer they are, the better they can withstand uh, the radiation from the sun. And so the analogy that I use in class, and, and we've all seen this, if, you know, if you live anywhere where it snows, you know, the last thing to ever melt are those snow plows, so those, those mountains that uh, are created next to the sides of roads where the snow plows came through. All that snow is compacted together, so it's able, to, you know, those, those snow uh, molecules, right, the water molecules of the snow are, you know, able to kind of like mutually reinforce themselves. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm speaking in very generalities, but the idea is that, yeah, you've got, uh, you've got a little bit of uh, safety in numbers, you might say, whereas if things are spread out uh, more widely, if they're more diffuse, then UV radiation uh, really will, uh, you know, photo dissociate uh, your, your, ring, your ring material, depending upon what it's made. Great question, Flavio. I hope I was able to address that. Uh, but, uh, you know, that's my boy right there, you know, with that great observation. Love it. Okay, uh, let's see. If I, uh, oh, hey, Shannon Miko. Hey, Shannon, how you doing? Hi, Professor Reddy. Could you please go over orbital resonances and how they help maintain rings? Sure thing, uh, Shannon. Let's go ahead and do that. Uh, give me a second. I'm going to go ahead and just set up uh, my, uh, my slides here. And uh, we'll uh, bring that up. We'll just take a quick look at it. Uh, first thing to think about is what are orbital resonances, right? I mean, making sure we're all on the same, all on the same page here. The key thing about an orbital resonance is that you're talking about having uh, an orbit that is a a multiple, essentially, of some other orbit. Okay, so let's uh, let's take a look at this. Once I can find it. Aha! Uh -huh, here we are. So let me switch over to my other monitor. Hopefully you can see that. Let me turn this off. And I hope you can see this okay. Right. Uh, so what we have here, uh, you know, this is just my illustration of Saturn. And, uh, you know, Saturn's rings have gaps in them. Okay. They're, you know, they're not completely empty, but they're mostly empty. So the Cassini division is, is uh, the largest of these gaps. And I think it makes uh, for a good, a good illustration. So consider uh, a test particle, okay, which I've, which I've really enlarged, right? So you could see it, and you notice, if you look closely, it's right on the inner edge of the Cassini division. But then, just beyond the rings, is Saturn's moon Mimas. So that means that when this particle reaches the inner edge of the Cassini division, it falls into a two-to-one resonance with Mimas. And what that means is that for every two orbits of the particle, I'm going to go ahead and just start the start the movie here, okay? And if you watch, if you count the number of times that the particle goes by, one, two, Mimas completes a single orbit. One, two, right? That means every other orbit of that particle, it finds itself getting a gravitational tug from Mimas. And you notice that that tug over time accumulates. And with every tug every other orbit, that particle gets pulled farther and farther out from its previous orbit until it reaches the inner edge of the next ring system. When it gets to be this far away uh, from Saturn, right, when it gets to this distance, it falls out of orbital resonance with Mimas. Now it's free to pursue a circular orbit without having to worry about getting a regular periodic tug that will disrupt its orbit. But you notice that those particles, if this were an ice particle, you know, for example, has now joined all of these other ice particles. And this is what's keeping the rings protected from photo dissociation. And it's all thanks to an orbital resonance. Now, there are many orbital resonances like this around Saturn. I mean, Saturn has many moons and there are many ring systems. So you're gonna find lots of these gaps that are being uh, kept tidy, you might say, or maintained uh, via orbital resonance. So it's important to remember that this is just one mechanism, right? There are other mechanisms by which these ring systems are maintained. Orbital resonance is one of them, but they're all due to uh, contributions from their moons. Okay, so uh, Shannon. How are we doing there? Did we, uh, am I addressing your question? Are you feeling like you got a 
good understanding of how orbital resonances work, just uh, drop me a drop me a line, yes, no, or I have no idea what you're talking about. Ready? Um, you know that's okay. <laughs> Uh, Superluminal says, hey, Superluminal, it's good to see you. Um, it's so weird that Saturn has a hexagon. You know, I, I, I know what you mean. Uh, when you, when you see this image, uh, let me go back to my illustration for a moment. Uh, when you see this image, yeah, it's kind of, you know, you see that little hexagon down there, uh, at the very top or at the very pole of Saturn. Uh, at first I thought, wow, that's so odd. But then I realized, actually, Earth has a hexagon as well. It's called it's called the jet stream, you know, effectively. And and uh, turns out these hexagons are actually uh, actually pretty normal. Uh, the, the, there is what you expect to see, uh, as it turns out. It's just that with Saturn, it's so pronounced, right? You've got such a nice change in chemistry there that you get this fabulous, you know, blue rich hexagon. But when you get right down to it, we actually have one too. So, oh, wonderful, Shannon. I'm so glad. Uh, I'm so glad that can help. Uh, I'm so glad I was able to help you out there. Uh, but please let me know if there's anything else that, uh, that I can do to, to clarify further. All right, let me go back here. Um, so, uh, so Piper, Piper Trips asking, how does photo, how does orbital resonance protect against photo dissociation? Uh, hey Piper, good to see you. I think, uh, I hope I answered that or I hope I, I think I mentioned it. I don't know if you caught it or not, but the idea is that if you have, uh, these orbital resonances, what they're doing is they're they're keeping these ring particles bunched up, okay? And, and and a really simple analogy, and you know, there's there's much more to it than this, but the simplest first order analogy is again using the snowplow analogy, right? If you if you bunch up a bunch of snow, it's going to it's going to be a, it's going to take a lot longer for it to melt, uh, whereas the snow that's just on the ground that hasn't been bunched up into a mountain ha is is going to melt pretty quickly. That's what's happening here. The orbital resonances are well, they're clearing the gaps for one thing, but then they go a step further. It's not so much about clearing the gaps. It's about keeping the, the water ice particles of Saturn's rings uh, clumped together uh, into these uh, close quarter ringlets. Okay, And that's what's keeping these, uh, these rings or helping to prevent these rings from photo dissociation. Okay, I hope I addressed that. Uh, but let me know if I haven't. Okay, so... Um, Oh yeah, superluminal. Yeah, the jet stream is a hexagon. Yeah, I know. <laughs> the more you know, right? Doon, 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 doon. Uh, let's see. Uh, easy PC. Nice to see you. Band. No, I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. I know you're just joking. <laughs> cool, Piper Chip. I'm glad. Glad that's worked out. All right, fantastic. Um, so uh, Peter points out that aren't Saturn's rings going to disappear in the future? Yeah, there's that. <laughs> um, all right. Well, uh, this is a, I, I guess really the best answer is maybe. Okay. Uh, but you're right. Um, there has been some work that was done uh, that was published, I think, a few months ago. And, uh, and I didn't mention this in my class because, uh, well, to be very honest, I, I personally had forgotten about it. Um, but uh, it looks like, yeah, it looks like the rings are disappearing uh, very gradually over time. And, and so the question, and, and really what, I'm, what I should say, I shouldn't say disappearing. I, I want to be more precise. These rings, despite all of the shepherding mechanisms that the moons do, uh, these rings are still you know, they're still being photo dissociated. They're still, uh, not only that, but they're also losing angular momentum. And so what that means is that they are, well, they're basically are spiraling in uh, to Saturn. Okay. Uh, they're getting trapped up in magnet. Some of the, sometimes they get trapped up in magnetic fields and they fall in that way. Other times they just spiral in, they reach the inner edge of the rings and they just go on in. Uh, so, and then, and then photo dissociation is also playing a role there. So these rings need to be replenished. And there are a number of, there are several mechanisms by which the rings do get replenished, courtesy of the moons. Uh, but also, you know, whenever something just falls into orbit and wanders into the Roche lobe and Roche limit rather and shreds up. So the question now is, right now it appears that the, uh, at the rate of, of uh, reduction, I guess, is, is greater than the rate of replenishment. 
That doesn't mean, however, that this is a linear projection that, okay, that means it's guaranteed the rings are going to go away. No, it just means that something will have to happen to, you know, for the rate of replenishment to overcome the rate of, um, of attrition, let's call it that. I can't remember what the appropriate term is, but uh, that's that's really the the challenge that Saturn faces. Uh, it wouldn't surprise me if the rings did disappear sometime. Um, and these are not going to disappear within our lifetimes. We're still talking, I think, uh, I can't remember what the what the projections are. A few million years, I think, maybe. I, it's it's a ways it's a ways down the road. I can't quite remember. Anyhow, uh, yeah, that's that's our. That's a that's a really interesting question. So the question, I'm sorry, I'm rambling here. So the real question then is, will there be something that happens to replenish the rings? And the answer is, don't know, don't know. But uh, we would expect those rings to be uh, to be temporary, otherwise. <laughs> okay. Uh, let's see. Um, Oh, hey, Aaron Wilson. It's great to see you. Thanks so much for coming in. <laughs> oh, man, that's fantastic. Uh, wow, guys, we're almost at the end of our hour. This this went by a lot quicker than I thought. Hmm. Um, uh, let's see. Do I still have any students that uh, need questions responded to? You guys are my top priority, but I'm always happy, always happy to uh, to chat. Okay, got Unlucky Moon. And I don't mean to be one of those uh, live stream hosts that just sits there and reads, but I just want to make sure I'm not missing any of my questions from my students. All right, fantastic. So guys, yeah, it's uh, it's been cool. I mean, there's a, there's a lot of neat stuff going on in in the universe, and uh, I'm I'm uh, oh yeah, uh, James, you point out that uh, one of the rings is uh, being fed by the jets coming out of Enceladus. Got that right. Absolutely. Um, in fact, uh, let me let me skip ahead here a little bit. Let me find my uh, let me find that slide because it is pretty cool uh, how Enceladus does does this. So we have uh, Enceladus, right? This is its moon right here and it's got these beautiful, cryovolcanoes. I mean, literally cold volcanism. I mean, it, it, it's it's pretty amazing. And what's going on is, um, is you've got, let me just zoom in here. Yeah. So here's what we think is happening. Okay. There's, there's some internal heat in its core. It's not necessarily hot enough to be like, we're not talking like liquid molten iron, but there's some internal heat. This is almost entirely due to uh, tidal heating from Saturn itself. Let me get rid of some of my overlays. My apologies here. Get rid of some of the mess. And this was a huge surprise. Uh, when Cassini flew around Enceladus, uh, or I'm sorry, flew around Saturn for 12 years, this was perhaps the largest surprise uh, ever discovered, just to see that these, uh, these plumes were coming out. So there's some internal heat making its way through these fissures, and you get this cold volcanism. And yeah, sure enough, that's what's going into replenishing uh, Saturn's E-ring. Pretty cool, huh? <laughs> hey, Savage Scientist, how you doing? Good to see you, man. Uh, let's see. So Superluminal asks, uh, because these rings, because Saturn's rings are so thin... Oh, yeah, Saturn's rings do appear, right, they do, quote-unquote, disappear every now and again. Uh, because, you're right, we see the rings edge on, and we they, they effectively disappear. I mean, the thing about Saturn's rings that uh, is really remarkable is that we're talking about, we're talking about something that's about 10 meters thick. You know, I mean, for as however many hundreds of thousands of kilometers, right, you know, across they are. It's just, a, they're just enormous rings. They're the largest ring system in the solar system. And yet for as large as they are, they are only 30 feet thick. <laughs> 30 feet. I mean, think about that, you know. Uh, that's incredible. So yeah, when, uh, you know, because of the, uh, 
because of the relative planes of the orbit of Saturn and of Earth. Occasionally, we intersect Saturn's orbital plane, and when we do, we see its ring system edge on, which is to say we don't see the rings at all. They just disappear from view. And for a rare moment, you actually see Saturn as, as a ball planet. <laughs> so, yeah, it's, it's pretty cool. They're that thin. And uh, as I was telling my, uh, my students, if you were to uh, take Saturn and shrink it down to the size of a regulation NBA basketball, a sheet of paper is 1,000 times too thick to represent the rings to scale. You have to take a sheet of paper and somehow shave that down to just one one thousandth its present standard thickness, and then you've got the ring system of Saturn against that basketball. That's That still blows my mind. Hey, C Chris Conkle, or Construction Cronies, as he's now calling himself, man, thank you so much, brother. Appreciate your... Appreciate your support. Thank you so much. I'm so glad you're here. It's great to see you. <laughs> wow, this is so cool. It's like it's like some people hanging out here. This is neat. Uh, David Sims points out that after the sun is a white dwarf, we're going to burn the hydrogen and Saturn live for another. Uh... <laughs> yeah, sure. I don't think it's going to be that. That I don't think it's going to work quite like that. <laughs> Uh, so detecting, all right, so, so detecting something, uh, just 10 meters thick that far away. Yeah, but keep in mind that most of the time we see the, we see the rings at some angle. So, you know, we're fine. Uh, now, um, well, <laughs> you are so kind. I'm not a genius. I just, I just fake, uh, you know, I fake it till I make it, but, uh, no, nah, it's okay. We, we all know, we all know a lot about something. And, uh, and I just happen to know a lot about astronomy, but it's not like I know how to like build stuff <laughs> like you, dude. <laughs> I mean, come on. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, anyhow, guys, it's uh, four o'clock. I uh, really am thankful for all of you to coming out today. And, and uh, wow, this has just been a lot of fun. I look forward to doing this with you again. I do promise I will do this with you again sooner rather than later. Um, and uh, and I guess I have to because in a couple of weeks I start giving my final exams and that may just be another excuse to live stream. Who knows? So let me see. Uh, yeah, I think we can expect to see a final two weeks from, or uh, a final exam review two weeks from today. How's that sound? So we'll set a date. We'll see you guys on, uh, or is it going to be two weeks from today? Yeah, it's going to be, uh, no, no, it's going to be sooner than that. Well, anyway, I'll let you know. might be next Friday, actually. <laughs> so yeah. Oh, don't Jim. Good to see you. Yeah, I think we're about done here for the day, man. Uh, it's been a lot of fun talking to you guys. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much for all of your support. Thank you so much for the super chats. Thank you so much for being, uh, those of you who are my patrons, thank you so much uh, for supporting this channel. Uh, I do promise more videos are coming. It's been, it's, it's just been one of those months and I, and I won't get all the details. Life happened, you know, and that's, that's what it is. But guys, ladies and gentlemen, my friends, thank you so much for your support. And as always, stay curious, my friends. See you next time. Bye-bye.